Well, hello and welcome to what is the 34th episode of the Adoption and Fostering Podcast. Uh, I'm Al Coates and... I'm Scott Casson. Rene. Well Good done, evening. <laughs> You're a bit perplexed by I remember my name. Yes. Hello, Scott. How are you? I'm good, Al. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Uh, full of busy, had a busy week, and I'm very glad January's over because, oh man, just drags and drags, doesn't it? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, tonight we've got a very interesting guest, uh, and I don't know whether you recall, but back in the autumn, back when we were young and happy, I asked um, if any adoptees would be interested in coming on the podcast, and I had a few people got in touch, and it we kind of got into I got into conversations with them, and people saying, "Well, what what are we going to talk about? What you know, yada yada yada." Lots of interesting questions, and I kind of, um, yeah. Um, but one that kind of came through was a young woman called Cat Peace, who we are going to speak to tonight. And you've listened to the interview. What did you think of it? Well, not don't tell me what you think of it, but is it good? <laughs> don't tell me. Spoil it. But, yeah, don't um, don't spoil it. I I I I was impressed. I think is the words the word that I would use. Yes. Um, not impressed by your interviewing skills at all, obviously, because you're no Paxman, are you? But I was interview. I was in. I was more <laughs> impressed by her um, responses and what she shared with that with you, and um, yeah, just some of the insights she had. And, and um, yeah, and I've got a few things I'll say, but I won't say it until Excellent. people have listened. Uh, in yes. terms of my view on a few of those little points. Jolly good. That would, be unfair, that would be unfair. That would be unfair. I do have a few things there and mm-hmm. some housekeeping, uh, podcast housekeeping. Right, uh, okay. Scott, I've been looking at the January statistics for the podcast, which is all very exciting, and because I'm very sad, and it's how I get my, uh, it's how I bolster my sense of approval and my low self esteem. I read my, I, I look at the statistics, and um, right, what can you guess? Right, <laughs> if only we were joking. Um, the, the um, oh right, I get the geography stuff. We're all three of our listeners. Yeah, where all three of our oh, listeners okay. come from, the top three countries. Come on, where do you think the yeah. most listeners come from? Oh, blimey. It's not um, a trick question. Well, I mean, is it quite specific? Geography? Is it regions, cities? What, you know, what, what are you looking at? Countries, here? countries. Oh, countries? Yeah. Well, England, I would imagine. Uh, United Kingdom. But yes, I'll give you that. Um, but right. you know what? I've gone down, and then I'll, I'll give you the first few. Uh, then it's United States is second. Which is oh really okay yeah about f- hi everybody in the United States yeah oh, my days I'm Hello. surprised you've you've can listen can relax a bit but you yeah. welcome lovely to have you etc 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 um so that's about thirteen percent and then China no yes it's really? only, yeah really then China and then South Africa Australia. I'm going oh. down. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I, I have it in my head that we, like, you know, 95% of our listeners are in England and the other 5% are from Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. <laughs> no, no, it's only 80% from uh, from the United Kingdom. And I mean, I have to, you have to kind of play into some of that that people will be accidentally downloading it. And that's what I'm taking it as. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they probably see the, the weird, um, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So I think I'm probably right then. <laughs> yeah, you think you're very right. <laughs> um, so go down Australia, Finland, Hong Kong, and this is the one that really tickled me, was um, Madagascar. Oh, I'm, what percent in Madagascar? <laughs> it's, it's a quarter of a percent, but like, there's three people from, there's been three downloads this month from Madagascar. But the thing is, right, now, no, bear with me here while I just talk this through, because yeah, this is quite this. an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, so if you think about some of the travelling that I do and some of the people I meet, that uh-huh. actually wouldn't be too much of a surprise because you do have, yeah, well, no, seriously, you do have <laughs> people who may be interested or you may, yeah. you know, yeah. very bored. Like you say, I mean, you know, they may be downloading it by accident. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you would need to look at the previous downloads to know if there's a pattern there, wouldn't you? Oh, but, a pattern. That's I can really get the last three months. Let's, let's see the last three months. Um, this is like really, this is the dullest podcast ever, isn't it? Man looks at yes, the things on the internet. No, no, I think it's important actually, but I, I, I really do think that, you know, if people oh. are, are listening that far and wide, then OMG. OMG. I I'm, I'm feel quite um, 
quite honoured that people would listen from Madagascar, to be fair, because, probably, you know, I'm sure there's other things that they could be doing in Madagascar. Um, well, maybe there's not. That, maybe that's what, the issue. Well, problem, yeah. <laughs> Once you've watched the film and the, and the sequel and the one after that, then what's left to do? Um, <laughs> and I don't know. I'm probably disparaging across a whole country. Um, yeah, 80% is about what we get in England, uh, UK. And then America's about 15%. Yeah. yeah. And then it's various countries. Mm-hmm. Finland. Yeah. Anyway. I think it should be interesting. That is interesting. And, and if anyone's really listening, interesting. yeah, if anyone is listening and they're really, really feeling benevolent to us, go to iTunes and put a review on. And I don't even mind if it's a bad review. If it's a comedy review, that would be even better. If someone could review Scott's yeah. beard on the iTunes uh, website, that would be oh, wonderful. Yeah. And to be fair, it's beginning to look fabulous, it has to be said, despite what... Mm-hmm one or two listeners think um but yeah i think they should and or tweet us even yes tell us that they're listening from whatever country they're listening oh well, that's exciting that would be interesting as yes well. at podcast yeah. i can't remember how twitter is at adoption foster yeah. something adopt yeah it's you can find it it's a, it's a stupid set of letters yeah just yeah I do have a question for you though because yeah. i just tweeted yeah. it out and the question is what would you t- what advice would you give your younger self well, I know who the question is from because I've read it already. All right. And it would be, do not connect with glitter nails on Twitter. There you go. End of. So That's what I tell my younger self. So wise. Go and ask. <laughs> <laughs> what would no? But in all seriousness, oh, I've had a, I've had a, I've had a little bit of a weekend of um, consolidation and recovery because I've had like, well. I won't go into details, but I've not been able to shake this call since November and I've kind of had a bit of a down weekend. And then my mum, who I very rarely see or hear from, um, surprised me with a with a, um, a visit from my niece, who's 20, but I've only ever met her twice. Oh. Um, and oh. I did share on Twitter earlier because my brother obviously is no longer with us and yeah. he was, his mental health didn't um, afford us the opportunities to to know her when she was a baby and growing up and stuff and i had a visit from her today actually and and having thought about the relationship that i have with her or don't have with her should i say because it's it's a little bit socially awkward because we yeah. don't know each other that well we've been friends yeah. for a long time on facebook and we've communicated but i face to face we've not done too much and i think that I would be, t- and and it's very personal, but I would be telling my younger self, actually, you need to, you need to do something about this. It, uh, your your relationship with her is nothing to do with your brother's relationship with her. That's quite deep for mm. a Sunday night, but that's how I'm feeling this weekend. I'm I'm feeling quite soppy, mm. so that's what I would do. I yeah. would do that. Go and ask me. What would you tell you? Oh, I'm, I'm actually dreading asking this question. What would you tell your younger self, Al? Well, I've given it, had some, I've given it some thought and had some time to think about it. I think really it's uh, it's uh, August uh, 1988. Double denim never looks good. Oh, Don't, I was two years old. Yeah, do you fly? Yeah. Don't go for double denim. I think that's really it. I mean, you just you never double up your denim. And um, Mrs. C got a photograph of that, please. I have got a photograph of or that. Or was she not around? No, she wasn't. I didn't know. Oh, okay. We we often laugh because um, uh, there's an age gap between Mrs. C and I, and um, if I'm yeah. feeling impish and cheeky and uh, looking for a bit of chastisement verbally, uh, I'll remind her that when on her twenty first birthday, uh, I was eleven. And, um, oh my God! Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, and she kind of goes pale at the very thought. And yeah, yeah but anyway. But can I just say she looks a lot younger than you? But anyway, <laughs> I, um... I get that all the time. It's not even a joke. <laughs> People genuinely like look at me a gog and go, "You look so old," yeah. and she looks so yeah, young. Just... Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. Anywho, shall we get on with this with this interview, and then we'll um, we'll yes. wrap it up and we'll reflect on it afterwards. Okay. Well, Which... so okay, so this is a uh, cat Pierce, and she's a young adoptee. So, Kat, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I put a call out to any adoptees who would be interested in coming on the podcast and you put your name forward. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for coming on. So, could you tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do and you're part of an organisation and who they are and what they do? 
Yep. So um, I'm Kat. I'm um, a online uh, adoptee voice, I suppose, since um, 2012. And um, in 2012, I realised that um, being an older adoptee, as I was um, adopted at seven years old, and I remembered um, being adopted and fostered and my birth parents, that there must be other people like me um, that had that like life experience Mm -hmm. behind them before they were adopted um so I reached out and I kind of came across this whole buzzword of attachment and trauma and I hadn't really heard those before and all of a sudden things fell into place so um I got talking with a group of um uh predominantly uh reactive attachment disorder parents um in America mostly and um really helped me find a sense of purpose so um we came together and created Um, a group predominantly online called Patches, which stands for um, Promoting Attachment for Traumatised Children's Hearts and Educating Society Family Foundation, um, which again consisted of um, fellow adoptees, trauma survivors, parents, guardians, like uh, people that have been in care, lots of different um, voices um, in a group. And we would blog um, relevant things. Um, However, at the moment, quite a lot of them have found themselves busy in their other lives um so predominantly i'm the main um representative on both facebook and twitter right quite a responsibility there then (laughs) um so that was 2012 so i mean you you talk about like this discovery of attachment and you know trauma and what what was it that rung a bell in you that made you think oh that's what you know, what was that what happened well as i've explained on twitter i think to a, a few parents is that um when i was growing up um especially in the uk there hadn't really been much of a um leaning towards attachment mm. or i was basically told i'd had a bad childhood and i was a naughty child um and the two of those things wow. seemed to <laughs> They seemed to go hand in hand right the way through my school years and I was always placed in the sort of um, learning um, enhancement classes and, you know, encouraged into different kinds of therapy. Um, And basically, I just felt like I was constantly being sort of shaped um, because people looked at me and they said, well, you've had a hard childhood, therefore you have problems. Um, And then I think that Um, I got to the point, I think, where I was in my late teens and I said, right, I've seen all this stuff on the news about, um, you know, children that have been kidnapped and then returned to their birth parents, sorry, their original families. And I said, right, that's going to be me. I haven't been adopted. These have always been my family, but actually I was taken away. Um, And then when I started to do some work around my life story and stuff with a social worker after I'd had this revelation in, I say, maybe 2013, 14, um, they said that's quite common. I said, well, no one had told me that. <laughs> well, yeah, it helps if they'd mention it to you. Yeah, so I felt that there was this massive gap, actually, and it's massively being improved, and it's so lovely to see and kind of be a part of, because I know there's going to be a whole generation of young people that are going to be raised in much better idea of what's going on around them, what's happening to them. Um, but, uh, yeah, like I say, I was adopted in, I think, 93, 94 and then it wasn't until 2000 and something that I really kind of got a grasp as That's to actually... That's 20 years, isn't it? Exactly, that I wasn't crazy, there wasn't anything necessarily wrong with me, you know, that my, my behaviour and my upset and my actions and my hurt and broken relationships and all the things that I had for the past 20 years were actually quite normal, considering that I'd had a little bit of a, you know... In light trauma- of those yeah. early life experiences. I mean, that sounds quite... I mean, I don't want to kind of... I don't, I'm not a counsellor or a therapist, but I don't want to kind of open up cans of worms in our conversation. <laughs> um, but just thinking about you as a child, thinking, actually, I'm just a naughty child. I'm just something wrong with me. That must have been quite a quite an isolating and horrible kind of environment or world, inner world that you had. Yeah, definitely, because, of course, you end up feeling dealing with a lot of professionals. You end up dealing with a lot of adults. You see other children that aren't, seeing their social worker every week or their therapist every week and you know I'd have problems at school quite a lot um, which I'm sure a lot of parents can relate to with their children but like it always seemed that I was being uh, you know in trouble or having my parents called because I'd upset some kids or I'd lashed out or they'd upset me and um, I couldn't understand what it was that was so wrong with me um, 
even though people kept saying, oh, it's because, you know, you've had a bad childhood, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't understand that I was just being me. I was just trying to um, express myself in mm -hmm. any way that I knew possible. Um, and also as well, from the isolating point of view, it didn't help constantly, um, for me anyway, being told that I had to go and see professionals and professionals because I just wanted to tell my friends. But like, my friends didn't understand what, what's adoption, what's foster care. You know, I was always being told yeah. that maybe I was lying. So, again, I think it's really important to allow children to have those really open conversations um, so they have a better sense of identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, 93 is kind of a, that decade is quite a low ebb in adoption in some senses because it was coming out the tail end of all of you know the huge waves of adoption in the 60s and 70s um and i adopted in 99 so i went through the adoption process probably very similar to your adoptive parents and there was no mention of um i think like you you know children have had bad experiences and but beyond that there was no kind of science or fact or it was just this sort of felt very on reflecting very anecdotal about well some children get over it and some children <laughs> don't get over it and you know it's not potluck but it's so it's interesting that you sort of you that's the environment you sort of grew up in where people were just going well is, is, is she just a bad child is she you know is there something inherently wrong with her which is really oppressive yeah <laughs> if i can be honest <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's like I say, I'm really, um, really encouraged. And I really commend all the parents, like including yourself, that are, are really seeking a lot of help for their children. And they're, they're sort of involving themselves in online communities because my parents, with all the best will in the world, and we have the best relationship now, but they'd said even if all the, the resources that are available now, they said that's not us and we wouldn't have bothered. So I would have still been isolated yeah. because, again, I think it's just personal preference, really, with parenting. Yeah, I mean, some, I guess even now I meet people who have adopted maybe three or four years ago and they just, you know, they just get on with their lives and they're not, not necessarily looking for anything. They just, this is it. So they just crack on and they don't necessarily look beyond what they've got, which is fine. You know, people live how they want to live, don't they? Mm. So how have you been received? Because I think before we recorded, I was saying how there's, not that many voices, adult adoptee voices that are from the UK. There's a lot of American, which is culturally different. But how are you received online? Are you are people nice to you? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, like I say, when I was first, um, as I mentioned before we started recording, when I first started out, I was quite petrified to be potentially re representing lots and lots of different voices and generations. And there are lots of generational stories as well within adoption. I mean, I've met a lot of... Um, older adoptees that had maybe um, been born out of wedlock and then their mums had been sent away to, for instance, mm -hmm. Ireland and had children and there's all, been all sorts of scandals. So I'm a, just a different generation of it, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've only had a couple of people that I think maybe were um, projecting their own issues from that they'd had with their own children onto me by saying, you know, that I've been quite... Um, I think one person had once said, oh, you're making it all about yourself. And I said... I don't have to do this. I'm doing it to try and benefit other people. <laughs> yeah. I have quite a nice life. I, ha I run a little enterprise and I work with plants and adults with learning difficulties. I'm getting married. You know, I have a really, really... Thank you. It's really exciting. I've been very busy. <laughs> Imagine. But I, um, I have a really satisfying life. And like I say, my relationship with my parents is great. We don't talk about, you know, the, the hard times quite so much just because it took so much to get over them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for the most part... Um, you know, the online community of both Facebook and Twitter have been absolutely brilliant. Um, I've been able to uh, speak recently at the Open Nest conference, which was really lovely. And I'd like to do more of that if I was ever invited to. Um, so, yeah, like I say, I'm, I'm one voice. And I, I'd like to think as well, I've come across several more adoptees that are feeling like they as well want to kind of add to that um, collective of voices. Yeah. Um, so if anything, again, I have a, a, an anecdote, really, of when I was at a friend's um, wedding and uh, one of her little bridesmaids had just been adopted by her godmother. And we were in the car going to the ceremony and the little girl was saying, oh, I'm adopted because my mum did this and my dad did that. And everyone in the car went silent. Yeah, awkward pause. Then I said, yeah, and it was because it was quite intense stuff. But I said to her, 
um, I think I'd had a few champagnes, but I said, oh, really? I, I'm adopted too. And, you know, and I kind of explained a bit about myself yeah. and she really warmed to me. And again, like I say, I just believe it's really important because again, it's, if we don't offer young people an opportunity just to be themselves in their own natural skin, they won't um, be comfortable and they might go on to have, you know, unnecessary um, additional trauma from that experience. So like I say, online has been um, really good. But again, it's just I think about um, as with anything, mental health or learning difficulties, just being very open with people so yeah. that they see you know you're not necessarily labeled as just being a bit crazy or you know a bit attention seeking to have just very very transparent conversations yeah I mean that's fantastic because I think there's a lot you were also you you were also chatting before and you were saying how that you're you're very keen that your perspective is one perspective and one experience and um how a lot of you know you adoptees older and younger don't necessarily want to talk about it and that's fine but that's the same for adopters, you know. Some of us, you know, I'm people like me and Scott. We're totally out there, but <laughs> um, we don't want to project that onto our children because my children don't want to talk about it. Or some yeah. of them do, some of the time. Um, yeah, of course. And that's the thing as well. Like, and I've said on Twitter and things in the past, and as I've touched on here as well, my parents have said, "Right, well, you've had some problems. You need to go and talk about it. Then you'll be fixed." Um, mm. But again. Yeah. At that time, like I say, it took me until I was in my 20s to sort of really be comfortable with with discussing who I was. And that took a lot of work on my part. So, again, I think, as you say, if children don't open the conversation, it shouldn't necessarily be forced on them. Um, But again, if they want to have those conversations or just having the information readily available, if if they want to discuss it. But again, it's, it's the same thing with anything. It's like you can't necessarily force a child to me have a certain hobby or a talent or something so it's the same I think like their identity and life story work but again if they want to discuss it then I believe that that should be an Mm -hmm. option I mean thinking of the time you adopted you mentioned life story work I was thinking you look we take for granted that we should happen were those things that happened for you as a child were there you know did you get a later life letter did you have um, annual letters contact letters were those things that were around or was it just not part of the landscape at the time? Yeah, it was, I think, because it was maybe a few years into um, after the Child Protection Act. And I think these things were kind of getting a bit more developed, um, maybe even in full swing by then. But I got a, a photo album of my new family. Right. Which I would parade all around the school, uh, my infant school. And I hadn't realised that the kitten in the photo album was the same as the cat in the photo album. <laughs> So I kept telling all my school friends that I was going to go live with this kitten. Um, right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I had, a, you know, postbox contact at Easter and Christmas. My birthday is just after Christmas. And um, my birth father would constantly send parcels through the post, which sent social services insane. Um, and I was quite fortunate, again, like I say, to be able to do some post-adoptive work and actually get my, my paperwork. But um, I remember as a child having the postbox contact, I felt quite a lot of pressure, for one, because um, having that contact with people that you were once very close to, and it would be very emotional for me. Yeah. So sometimes I couldn't always reply, you know, because it just felt like an awful lot of um, emotional, you know, emotions being riled up and you know as a child I was like I was just trying to focus on day-to-day living so then when my grandparents my birth grandparents died I felt quite guilty that I'd not contacted them as much as I could but I understand that I I couldn't force myself into a position where I was able to be in contact more frequently because I wasn't in I wasn't ready in that place I guess you're Uh, a child as well so you have limited choices and in that sense don't you and there were lots of occasions as well where I think my parents sometimes they'd receive letters or, you know, and, you know, if I wasn't in a good place, like I was, you know, having issues at school or, you know, you know, having what you might call like an episode of bad behavior. I yeah. don't know what you'd describe yeah. it as, but sometimes they kind of withhold information from me. And then, but then when I got it, 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 it created more problems because I felt like I'd been, um, like left out of the loop or, so you know, so it's really potentially difficult. for not because you'd see the dates on the letters and think well why didn't I get it why am I getting it late 
Yeah, so it was it was one of the it's really hard, obviously, isn't it, trying to balance, you know, because my parents always said we're not keeping anything from you, but sometimes they'd have delays from social services yeah. with the letters and that sort of thing. But then I would get upset with them. Um but yeah, the whole the contact and stuff was very much a part of my life growing up, but it was also you know, I, I've I've written a blog before because my, my birth mother, um, she's passed away now, but she would suffer with really bad um, mental health episodes. She's one of the reasons I was adopted. And I could tell, even from the envelope, when she was having a bad period because her handwriting would be really, really shaky. Right. Um, and again, as soon as I'd see that, that would set me off. You know, it's quite an emotive um, experience, the contact. It's important. But Yeah, I mean, it, you sound like you had an awful lot of contact. Um, I know a lot of children who don't get anything you know and my children for a decade got nothing um mm. it, was, it was a one-way stream from us so it sounds like it was quite there was quite a lot of openness and a lot of a lot of information floating around and you say i, I was reading on your the facebook page which actually tell me the the contact details and how people can access kind of all the stuff that you're doing what's your facebook page um, so yeah, Facebook is basically Patches, uh, P A T C H E S Family Foundation, uh, RAD, which is stands for Reactive Attachment Disorder, um, which is also known as Developmental Trauma Disorder and Attachment Trauma in this yeah. country. It's got different facets to it, um, but also on Twitter, it's um, at Patches FF. I'll put all that on the um, on the posty blog thing. <laughs> I, know, I know all the technical terms because um, I think it'd be really interesting I think you've got a really a quite a unique perspective because often we hear I mean when you look at the media representation of adoptees you've got things like um, the Nikki Campbell TV program Finding My Fat what's it called is it Finding My Family Long Lost Family Long Lost Family or something do you watch yeah. that I haven't no but I've I've heard a lot of people that have it's opened conversations that have been quite healthy yeah. Um, but again, like I say, because like it seems that you have lots of different facets even within adoption and fostering. And I was one of those, like I say, that I was adopted quite late. I'd been fostered, you know. Um, I was an emergency um, placement in that I was um, removed by the police under a court protection order. So again, you have some adoptees that have maybe. Um, been adopted from other countries or some adoptees that have been adopted at birth or there's so many different um combinations and yeah streams but i was thinking that kind of public perception is still kind of quite weird by the nikki campbell stuff finding my family long lost families sorry i don't watch it um so do you find that people are surprised when you you, you can you're talking really vividly about the stuff that my children experienced. My daughter was six when she was adopted, my eldest daughter. Um, and people are, that just isn't the, the adoption story they see on the telly, is it? It's not the, you know, the that story of the mum who you know got pregnant and the family said, oh, you've been a naughty young woman. Your story is very <laughs> different, isn't it? It's It's much more visceral. Yeah, and again, I believe that that's generational, so that maybe um, the the adoption narrative is sort of, you know, it's always, I find a few generations behind. So I think maybe now people are looking at the long lost families and the, you know, maybe the slightly different stories, but then in maybe in other 20 years time, they'll be looking at, for instance, myself and your eldest daughter and yeah. the, the sort of stories that have surrounded that. Um, of which there have been a few, I can't bring any to mind at the moment, but I think I remember reading about a couple. Um, and I remember as well when I was growing up, um, my dad would tell me all the adopted um, celebrities that he knew of. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to name them because I am not 100% sure if they're adopted or fostered and I don't want to drop yeah. myself. No, I'll not put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. A memory test. Yeah. But that's, yeah, the, 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 the generic adoption narrative and the story and that sort of thing. And I think that as well, because social media and that is now very, again, quite open, I think some people are put off because, again, they, they're they expecting the, the bog-standard packaging of adoption that people are uh, perceiving on TV, that sort of thing. But actually, then, if you were to just delve into social media and type in hashtag adoption, it's a whole other ball game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I think yeah, some people are sort of, but that's one of the reasons, for instance, because I was asked to go on TV for National Adoption Week when I think I was um, 18 
but my mum said no don't do it because um you've got a driving test she later confessed that it was actually more because um my perspective at that point would have been like don't do it adoption's the worst i hate my parents um (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, which obviously isn't isn't the case now and i'm quite grateful for that but that would have um, been an interesting um i would have loved to have seen that interview you know you wheeled you on in the telly and saying you know this is a young person who's been adopted tell us all the good things and you go on get lost to love you (laughs) Yeah, basically. Um, so, yeah, and but then I think as well, sometimes people are quite scared, again, to hear adoptee voices or, you know, adopters that are in the, in the thick of it because sometimes they don't always say the things that fit the narratives. And, again, like I say, having um, spoken with the Open Nest and things, I really liked that. Um, and as, as you'd explained before, I think we started recording that actually they have lots of different narratives and they work with the birth mums and they work with the adopters. And because there are lots and lots of different voices that need to come together to get a much better understanding of the processes and the relationships and how we move forward. Yeah. And I think you've got a, no, I, I totally agree. And I just think that for a whole host of reasons, um, what I get slightly uncomfortable with is I think that adopters hog the stories i think that we get people feel warm and fluffy towards us and not entirely sure you know we're gobby and if you go on if you go on facebook or twitter it's adopters isn't it that's who you'll find much easier than you'll find adoptees um and maybe one adopt birth parent so we do hog the limelight so i'm kind of keen that we try and where people are happy with that we shine our light on people like you who've got really real clear perspective on a lot of very interesting issues and your your experience is really contemporary as well it's you've you've lived through what children are living through today you know because you're not old like me are you oh i feel old i feel (laughs) old (laughs) you're not (laughs) when you think about you know young people that were born in like 2000 turning 18 this year or next year uh, that makes me i'm 20 i'm 29 just gone 29 and um like i say i'm now a manager and i'm getting married and all this kind of thing and i do feel like a whole generation like older than lots of yeah. hip young things yeah <laughs> uh, just a slip of a lass honestly you're just just a kid <laughs> but you but you're still your experience you like you say that you mentioned the children act 1989 which is what is the legislation that is underpins the adoption process now. So your, your experience is really relevant. And I think we need to, we need to hear your voice more. So have you got plans to do more speak? I mean, obviously you're very busy, but you know, more blogging, more Facebooking. Yeah. So at the moment I kind of, um, because the other thing is as well that I'm quite um, keen on having um, done residential care, especially is um, self care. Um, so as I say, uh, if people ever like yourself, um, were to ask, you know, for opinions or they, you know, specifically wanted me to speak, then that's fine. But like I say, there are so many voices out there already, um, as well. I don't want to just be forcing my opinions on people or forcing my, my viewpoint. So like I say, if people ever want to discuss that with me, that's fine. Um, and I'm quite happy to do that. But uh, again, I don't want to almost hog the limelight from all the other things that are going on because there are lots of, uh, like, for instance, Ben Ashcroft, yeah. who's the founder of the Every Child Leaving Care Matters. Yeah. Um, well done. Uh, project. Yeah, you know, so um, I believe there's lots of good work and stuff. And that's the thing is it's going to be a, a joint effort, I believe, between all of it says it's the um, the uh, proverb or something, isn't it? That it takes a village to raise children. Yeah. So I believe there's so many perspectives and, you know, if you get enough voices saying the same thing. So, yeah, like I say, um, my my blogging and my my thoughts and things tend to happen. I did the majority of them um, when uh, I was doing something that fellow adoptees call coming out of the fog. So I had a lot of um, unresolved, you know, thoughts about different things like my relationship with my parents and therapy and school and all these different things. And I really just went to town. Because I thought, if I'm going to process these things, I might as well do it publicly for other people to deal with. It's very brave. <laughs> but 
but it was something that I felt, you know, was necessary and I felt confident in doing that because I, I'd had support, like I say, from the post adoptive team and the fact that I've actually managed to my parents thought I was gonna die by eighteen, so the fact that I've managed to make it to twenty nine and actually Correctly. have quite a good start. <laughs> I think you must have downplayed your your school uh, you, you, know, you talked about slight wobbles at school and but cranky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's the thing and I think as well because like I say, I um and it's quite funny if I ever meet teachers or anything now. Actually, my um my social work teenage my teenage social worker who was my social worker when I was a teenager. She wasn't a teenager social yeah, working me. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, she's she's gonna. Well, we've invited her along to my wedding, um, or I will be when I next see her. But that's the thing. And if if people were to have seen me then they would have you know like with a lot of kids been like oh that one's gonna you know fail or that one's gonna be a statistic or that one's gonna and when I met my birth mum again she said I'm really glad you're not a heroin addict and I thought that was quite quite a prominent thing that I'll remember from meeting her (laughs) it's it's an interesting opening to a conversation isn't it (laughs) yeah Yeah. that Um, must have been really emotive for you though to to kind of restore that or start to make steps back to that relationship with your mum was that a process you're I'm asking really personal questions feel free to say no um I mean were your were your adoptive parents comfortable with that were they they support you yeah my mum actually came with me which was really lovely and um because the thing is I'd found out that my um because up until that point I'd I'd done all my life work you know my files and all the rest of it with a view to sharing it publicly um again for the benefit of others it's quite cathartic really because like then I'm able to kind of put it in a box and I've I've dealt with it but yeah. I've you know, put, the, put it out there if anyone else you know finds it useful but I found out she was terminally ill and that was um the kind of the crucial point because until that point I couldn't um imagine myself being in that relationship kind of regular contact because I I didn't know if it was if it would be like to be perfectly honest it almost felt like when I was growing up that the contact with my birth mum might actually be the one thing that would send me over the edge yeah so everything that I'd worked so hard for I did wonder if it would if it would regress me and I would go back to being that child and having all those feelings and not being able to process them as I am able to now so then when I found out she was terminally ill that was it that was like I have to go and see her and actually it was just like seeing a long lost I don't know auntie or something and you know there wasn't lots of wailing and crying my my birth mother had uh, quite severe bipolar um for her life um and I I again when I lived with her you know she was very emotive and you know very unstable so then when I met her again and I had I had built it up in my mind that there would be I'd be crying she'd be crying like you know it'd be really full-on but actually she was like oh I'm glad you're not a heroin addict and your mum's done really well. And, you know, my mum, my mum was smiling and my birth mum was quite pleased in her own way. And um, apparently before she died, she gained a lot of peace from that meeting. And actually I'd had a lot of peace as well because it wasn't, it wasn't, I'd faced my biggest fear. Of course. Yeah. Really. And um, then to come out of it, I was like, right now, what can I accomplish? (laughs) So um, it was quite, quite nice. Yeah, that sounds like a really remarkable moment and a, a pivotal moment for you to kind of um, open all that up and then sort of it to be something positive. Cause yeah, it... I'm quite fortunate because I know that some young people, you know, never get the opportunity to reunify yeah. or... And again, that's one of the reasons that I, I like to provide a perspective because I do feel like I've been the whole way through. Um, I, I remember my, you know... Um, birth family I remember my foster care I remember my adoption you know I had difficulties in school and all the rest of it and then um you know I got my file I reunified with my mum blah 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 so I do feel Did you like I've it difficult done... getting your file was it a was that a <clears throat> excuse me I know when my children got their files it was quite a profound moment and there was no surprises but actually to see it in black and white was really difficult the stories we told and the the, the accounts that we'd given but then just read it was whoa, it was a moment for them. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if it's like trauma brain, but um, I'd read through it a few times on different occasions, and I, when I'd gone back to it, there's loads of things that I'd read and taken on board that I'd mm. then forgotten again. Like my brain had sort of packed it away, and then I 
relived it again um but yeah very very profound i was very grateful again to have that um all that paperwork because i know especially in america they have real issues accessing their records yeah. and there was quite a lot of it um and again when i was working in residential care and i've mentioned it on twitter that um to have been on the other other perspective and when i was dealing with young people's paperwork and the wording and things it's really important that it's not just you filing paperwork it's actually people's lives and one day they might go back and read that and it could have an effect on them so trying to be like really quite sensitive to the fact that in because that one time i was working in residential care and there was just a cupboard just full of paperwork that had all been mishmashed from young people yeah. that had left and I went through and like meticulously filed the whole lot because I thought if a young person ever comes back and wants One their day, paperwork, yeah. then it, it would mean so much more to them to have it nicely presented rather than just here's a cupboard full of confidential paperwork, try and find yours. Yeah, and I worked, uh, I mean, I've only been qualified five years and I don't work in adoption, but I did do some work looking for some historic files for a young woman and um there was nothing it was i mean it was literally back of cigarette papers it was from a time before computers or computers were just sort of in and out and it was heartbreaking really because it just seemed to it just sort of said it wasn't important but it was important mm. um i was going to ask as well when you read it when you were reading it because obviously the one of the things i often think is that the to reach the threshold for adoption you've got to prove You've, it's kind of a, it's a combative, combative system, and you've got to say it's such a severe measure to adopt a child that we're actually there's there's no return. So when you read it, was there any positives in there, or was it just a wholly negative account of why you should be adopted? Um, it was like I say because I remember quite a lot of it, and it was just the finer details. I think one thing that really helped me personally, and this is going to sound horrible um, to anyone else, but for me it was like a real pivotal moment, as you'd say, that my birth mum had told a social worker, um, I think from the moment of conception, um, because I was, uh, um, no one actually found out that my mother was pregnant, I think, until about eight or nine months in. Right. So from the moment of conception and then even when she'd had me, she didn't have any maternal feelings. Right. Because as well, like being a, you know, voice on the online commu community in the past, people had said, oh, well, you live with your mum, you must have had some attachment, et cetera, et cetera. But then actually, because my mum wasn't mentally well and because she didn't necessarily want me, um, I think she did in her own way, but not in a traditional family yeah. sense. And that, that gave me so much um, relief because you know, all the behaviours that I'd exhibited and all the drama I'd had and all the, the problems, like I say, that were constantly pinned on me as being a bad child actually stemmed from day one when my birth mum was probably thinking, well, now what am I going to do? And, you know, she didn't she didn't have those yeah. those feelings. And when you're, you know, growing in the womb and you're developing and then she, she ran away from her entire family support network, which is one of the reasons I was adopted due to neglect. Um, I think emotional emotional neglect and there's lots of different um yeah. categories but yeah you know it, it wasn't like yeah child great which again a lot of people assume um that young people you know coming into the world is automatically going to be a happy thing and again i don't think yeah. a lot of people talk yeah. about postnatal psychosis or postnatal depression especially not back in the um 80s and 90s so um yeah the the for me so that was a positive for me I can see how that would you could you know, that, no I know exactly what you mean because you're you're kind of saying it wasn't you weren't ripped away from this idyllic w wonderful world and then just became this naughty child you yeah so so you there was a you could you can join the dots and see why the, some of your childhood struggles were there and why things didn't add up perhaps yeah and my my birth family as well you know um wanted me very much and they were very supportive but they understood that their situation they couldn't possibly have me um and again i think this is where it's really important to link up with rather than society saying all oh, birth parents are bad and you know because like i say my, my birth mother had mental health issues and if she had have had those and had me now she may have gone on to have a slightly more productive life so it's all part and parcel um because i think as well a lot of people sort of say well birth parents are all how could they treat their children like this how yeah. can kids end up abused but there's so many different factions 
to um like you say ad- adoption is a very combative process and it, ha- it usually they go through so many different um processes to get to that point um and my birth mum was offered quite a lot of help but she she said I, I just can't do it and you know she she figured that I would be better off um with an adoptive family um so yeah there was it depends on your perspective really yeah. I, like I say I found some positives in that because it helped me get a better sense of identity and you know um there were lots of nice things in there like my birth family would like write me little letters and things that were photocopied and put in the files um but again it, it's those are positives but again it's always very bittersweet because I think as well you kind of go a little bit of like oh why, why did that have to happen I mean I'm glad you know for my family my adoptive family that are my family and yeah. my life now but it, adoption is a difficult regardless so yeah you have to find the positives where you can <laughs> yeah yeah there's yeah it's like the thing where people will say to me you know they're, they're so lucky to have found you and you go well in the grand scheme of things it's a you know it was there's not been a lot of a lot of luck in or any of this so there's you know it, there would be much better to have stayed at home if things could have worked out so i think it's it, there is no clear black and white often it seems very murky very nuanced and very uncertain and the stories are really complicated you know that i used to sit on an adoption panel where we would approve children for adoption but it was kind of a they don't do it anymore um and every we would read the the histories of children and make a decision whether adoption was the right plan for them over long term fostering and without without fail the stories of the parents the, the children's parents were complicated tragic stories there was there was very i think well maybe one or two occasions where it wasn't but on the whole it was just stories of trauma laid upon trauma, laid upon trauma, generations going back. Uh, and there was no sense of, you know, a righteous act. You know, this is the right thing for this child. It was there was just a heaviness of heart. It was a, a sort of a sad inevitability, which was kind of probably where my whole, you know, my eyes, the scales fell off my eyes and I started to see the world differently at that point, I think. Um, so what, what does the future hold for you? I know you're getting married. Very well done. Thank um, you. Yeah, well done. Um, and what about your kind of your in the adoption landscape? Is it something you're just you just are comfortable in? Have, have you got plans, aspirations, or um, pottering on? Yeah, currently pottering on. But my aspirations would always be, and I've always said this. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was working for a charity, and my my supervisor at the time said, "Where do you see yourself in five years?" And I think I said something along the lines of riding the crest of a former trauma-informed society. Um, <laughs> As you do. All right then. Well, uh, that, and on that note. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Um, so like I say, I work with um, adults with learning difficulties and I manage a little um, enterprise, which is lovely. And um, my parents decided when I was, um, I think I'd done, I'd just scraped some GCSEs, like barely scraped my GCSEs. And um, my school were fighting my parents because my school actually were quite good and they wanted to um, take me on board and give me a hostel like home and have me like study for university. And my parents were like, nah, not going to happen. She's not going to concentrate. So they sent me off to um, uh, a vocational college where I learned about plants, which right. was really cool. I did a lot of partying as well. Um, <laughs> well <laughs> <actually didn't laughs> when... You must never meet seven... Scott if there's partying involved. <laughs> That sounds like fun. Um, yeah, I was 17 years old, you know, living away from home for the first time because my relationship with my parents had broken down. And I think that midway through that course, I suddenly thought, well, after this, what have I got now? I've got no social work involvement. I've got no qualification. I've got no home. So I really had to knuckle down. And um, for me, it's been really um, invaluable, um, the lessons I've learned through, like, horticulture and stuff. So I've just done, um, in October... Um, I think two days before or after I'd spoken at the Open Nest conference yeah. as well, which is cool. So I did a, um, a course for occupational therapists, even though I'm not one, but in um, social and therapeutic horticulture. So currently working wow. with adults and learning difficulties, but it's always been a dream of mine to be able to extend that to potentially a trauma-informed um, and attachment-aware um, option for young people. Because when I worked in commercial horticulture, I identified it would be a really awesome therapeutic and also very practical mm. 
way to get young people involved into maybe a career path or something to do. Um, so that's always been my long term goal on the back burner. So I kind of merged the adoption and attachment awareness stuff in my spare time and I'm doing the horticultural stuff in my full time. But one day I would like the two to be conjoined and um, I'd like to study a degree in it maybe, but I don't think one exists yet. You'll have to write it as well, won't you? That <laughs> yeah. sounds really interesting because I know that my ch- my some of my children love the outdoors and they find it such in a therapeutic environment and mud under the fingernails and the joy of growing. It, that yeah, we spent many an hour in my polytunnel when they were little. Oh, I'm ooh, I'm very excited about that. Will you promise to get back in touch when you do it so I can? Come. Yeah, of course. Like I say, it's ongoing at the moment. So I've got my little enterprise. I work with um, adults with learning difficulties. And, and again, you sometimes find that that overlaps as well. Maybe I might, because I find as well, it's almost a bit like autism and Asperger's in that there is a spectrum. And at some mm-hmm. point, everyone falls into that spectrum somewhere. So even if maybe people haven't been adopted or fostered or they might have attachment, yeah, you know, uh, somewhere on the spectrum. So I, I think as well, it's just very important, something that I'm quite keen to just encourage with anyone that I speak to is just be kind to one another because society needs more of that. We need a lot more kindness. Don't we? <laughs> I say to my children, and this is probably a bad thing to say, I say to my, my son was very clever at school and I said, it's all well and good being clever. I said, but, you know, the people who invented the gas chambers were clever. We need more kindness, don't we? Anyone can be clever. We need kindness. That was like quite a dark anecdote with my parenting, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> but it's, a very, a, it's a very good point. Drives the point home. Thank you. That was very gracious of you. <laughs> oh, Crikey. That was, I've just ruined it, a really good podcast. Oh, well, never mind. That's what the edit button is for. Uh, no, no, it's, um, and again, but that's the, and I think as well, as you've said about the, the scales on your eyes and things, um, I believe that you know families in the trenches and stuff, and that's one of the reasons again why I why I'm quite keen to talk about these things is you you can't as we said earlier you can't just have a one sided view of everything's perfect and kids will get adopted and everything's wonderful. You do have to have an element of reality, or it's just not mm-hmm. going to work. And sometimes reality is dark, and sometimes you have to laugh at it because otherwise we're not going to get through the day. Yes, yes, <laughs> heavens, yeah. Well, Kat, it's been wonderful to speak to you. I really appreciate you taking your time. And, and I guess there's an element of risk coming on and talking to me and um, just putting yourself out there. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And I wish you well with your marriage. You as well. Thank you very much for having me. Absolute pleasure. Um, we'll speak soon. For sure. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. <laughs> Well, there you go. That was Kat. And uh, what did you think of that then, Scott? I th- yeah, like I said earlier, it's, um, <clears throat> I, 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 I think she's rather secure, actually. I think that was the first thing that I noted. Re- yeah. So Very comfort- intelligent. Comfortable in her own Massive. skin. Yeah, extremely. And, and to share, to be fair, because you didn't, I, well, I didn't feel that you kind of pushed for the information that she gave you, but she shared a lot about Yeah. Her journey and meeting her birth mum and all that kind of stuff and, and her kind of mental health and all that sort of stuff um and yeah it's um I, th- I, th- I think what I was thinking throughout listening to it was I hope that when the day comes for my children to have had those, the opportunities yeah. and when they're grown up and and have matured and their brains have stopped doing whatever it, the is that they do up until the age of stroke 25, stroke 28, whatever it is these days. Um, <laughs> actually, they will be, yeah, cause I've got a feeling that it might be 30, you know, might even be 40, actually, because I think my brain is still trying to mature. Um, no but, comment. Yeah, I, I just hope that they've got that same reflection. Yeah. I mean, it, if that's the right word to use. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think like you, the, the she was very, you know, really generous with the time and really generous with her story. And mm. I think the thing that I, I listened to it when we did it, obviously, um, but often you don't, when, if you're interviewing people, you, you often, you're thinking about questions and, you know, how to link things together and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I re-listened to it. And um, uh, the thing that struck me was she might be the first voice I've heard of someone 
on the podcast anyway, of someone who's gone through the system as it is, whose story mm. sort of reflected yeah. my children's story. Of yeah. uh, you know, we've spoke spoken to other people, and they talked about you know, the, you know it's find your it's a find finding your long lost family kind of story. You know, my mother was yeah. you know, the, but she, mm-hmm. she had a story that was like the stories we hear now, mm-hmm. and, and so that was really yeah. hopeful. It gave me real hope for my yeah th- th- children. Which is great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and that's the thing. She didn't go into too much detail about her behaviours and things like that, which yeah. you know that's that right, and, you know, yeah. quite rightly, you know. Um, but that does give you that little bit of hope that actually, um, with the support of, and this is going to sound like I'm 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 kind of going against what we believe as as parents in this day and age, but with love and consistency and. You know, all that stuff that we put into this day in, day out, regardless of where we are, you know, and even to the point where, you know, we know you and I both know people who are parenting from a distance and all that sort of stuff, but yeah. they're still there for those children that one day, perhaps, maybe, hopefully, hopefully, that, you know, those children will come back from some of that to be able to have a relationship with the, with us as their parents. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's that's all that's all that we can hope for is that they grow up. Um, if, if you know, hopefully we know if they're going to be independent and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. Some aren't going to be quite as, um, you yeah. know, as have that kind of hope that we perhaps do. But, you know, for the majority, I would be hopeful that Kat's reflections will be the majority of our children's reflections when they get to that age. Yeah, she seemed to really able to hold together all the strands that, yeah. that we don't have, different strands, different tensions, different kind of... Um... Lo- no, loyalties is the wrong word, but no. I get, I guess no. a different emphasis. And I think in your children and parents, parents and children, you know, you know, that's a different dynamic anyway. But I just felt yeah. really, really. Um, I, I know it sounds a bit sycophantic, but really privileged to speak to her because I thought actually I want I need to know you more, and I want to kind of go yeah. to you and go tell me it'll all be okay. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, no. That- that's right and I think that you know I, I, the one thing I was going to say was because I've been reflecting on this for a couple of weeks now in fact for months and, and I've, I've mentioned it before actually it's about this adoptee voice that we keep on kind yeah. of referring to and and I think I, I have a little bit of an issue with the, with the adoptee voice in terms of you know a five year old who's been adopted and, and being able to get that that kind of um, information out of a five-year-old. I think that when when I'm talking about adoptive voice, people like Kat, who have been through the current system as it is, yeah. like you've said, they're the ones that actually are able to reflect and able to, um, you know, uh, to be able to um, influence the improvements that are needed to that system, all that sort of stuff. Mm. So when we say adoptive voice, it's all very well thinking, you know, because I, I, I think we do. We think about, you know, our own children as they are, you know, you with your three younger ones who are at certain ages. Yeah. They wouldn't be able to vocalize what they're feeling majority of the time. Yeah. So as parents, as parents we have to be that voice for them and some of the times we're making that assumption because we're making assumption of their feelings and their thoughts and all that sort of stuff because they don't communicate that well it's people like cat that we're now going to that we now need to be looking to and yeah absolutely kind of beyond to be able to learn from her and from others in her situation actually how can we reach you know a 16 year old a 14 year old a 13 year old i mean don't get me wrong there's a lot of work going on out there anyway we know that absolutely yeah it's but i i kind of i take heart from that but i take the opposite in terms of people assuming that as parents we we're not listening to our children sometimes our children aren't talking and that's really difficult that's a difficult thing to balance well i think it's it's a difficult dynamic anyway because some children you know i never talk to my parents you know, I just didn't at that age. It just wasn't on my agenda. I took my, I got counsel from other people, and I think that adds a, a layer of complexity. That you know, yeah. And a presumption that people want to talk about it as well, and so exactly. voices yeah. like cats are, are really valuable to us, and we need to find yeah. them. And I think the onus yeah. is on us. I mean, I always and I keep saying it again. I mean, I'm like a stuck record, but I do. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to become this sort of patriarchal voice that says oh i've allowed someone like that to come on the podcast or i allow you to speak i want her to have her own form and her own platform and to be able to speak how she wants when she wants and say whatever yeah. she wants 
Um, so and I still feel slightly uncomfortable inviting adoptees onto the podcast because of that, which is a, maybe me just being overly liberal. And, you know, I am a snowflake. I got called a snowflake yesterday. I, t- <laughs> I took it in the nicest possible sense, I think. Oh, my God. If, ever, if anybody ever called me a snowflake, I'd punch him. He's <laughs> Literally, square face. Would you? <laughs> yeah. I'm really happy being a snowflake. I'm, no. a, I'm a snowflake, oh, snowflake looking for other snowflakes to be to form a human avalanche. Um, yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. Oh, see, when you put things like that, why do you do that? You always put things like that. It's like, oh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> nice liberal, 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 livid. Anyway, um, I'm not liberal, sh- but liberal, uncommitted, and, and um, what's the word? Vanilla. Independent. Sure. Independent. Yeah, and vanilla, and splinters where... You've been sitting on the fence and all that sort of well, stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can yeah. Anyway, it. go on. Would you I'm say with... that? But I've had proper plumbing online fisticuffs <laughs> the last... Yeah, I've had more that's... grief, more grief the last few weeks. Oh, my goodness, that one-eyed cat's moving. I can see a one-eyed cat. It's just, it's just a tack to hump your keyboard. Yeah. I, uh... What's it called? She's all right. She's called Little Miss. Little Miss. She's a beautiful little cat. She's just been unlucky with her eye. And, you know, it's 18 months since she lost her eye. It's absent-minded and, of her. Yeah. And um, Tris was feeding them one day and the cat biscuit fell into the hole in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's a window so, in your domestic life, so, isn't it? Yeah. So so and the joke is that he got the dice now to get it out, but he didn't really. It's just that he came out of his own accord eventually. But yes, um, bless her. She is she is our one eyed little baby, and she's she is such a little lady as well. And it's just such a shame it happened to her because she's just perfect, and we just can't bring ourselves to do anything with her because she, apart from the eye, she is amazing for thirteen. Well, there you go. Yeah, but she, yeah, I'll keep. I'll, I was going to say I'll keep my eye out for that, but that seems yeah, inappropriate. Oh, I'm that sure. Joke is- no, we we actually cover her ears when you say things like, that. and she can hear you right now. She so, understands. Well. Yeah, I can't remember. I was saying from Joel. Was I saying anything? I was saying yeah. yeah, yeah. I've had a lot of Twitter grief, but I'm I'm okay now. Yeah, <laughs> I've been talked but down. I think that comes, you know, that comes with the territory. I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I got something said to me about a tweet I had made um, about I'd taken a photograph of one of my children cleaning the bath or cleaning the floor, and and it, unless you know me, you you wouldn't know the kind of humour that I make uh-huh. and I made a about um I, I said something about oh it's not often he does much around the house and I meant it in a loving way and someone tweeted me back going I would never expect to uh to get anything back from being a parent and da, 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 and I just thought do you know what I can either get into a conversation with you over this or I can just block you so I'm afraid to say <laughs> you just got blocked block. but, but not because I'm, you know, taking that to heart. I'm not. I'm just thinking to, to me, it's just like, well, you know, you, you you either go with the flow with this and you look at my timeline, you think Ashley is a bit of a joker, or you don't. Yeah. I am a bit of a joker. There is a, a serious side to me. Um, and you will know when I'm being serious. And that was not serious. Um, it's tricky, you know, isn't it? Because I, I'm, yeah. I am vanilla and I really want to like everybody. So I, tr- I, I really, I don't block people. Um, even when they're I don't being... as a real either. No, I don't. Cause, but I've just had a few times where people have started to get really shirty with me offline, mm. and just a bit snarky. And you think, oh, give over. And I think, I think you might find you'll get more of that as well as why. You know. what now you... that you've got a. What have you set acronym? up your own bogus Twitter no, account no, to get at me? No. <laughs> Obviously, you've you've got an acronym after your name now, so you know you need to. I was going to take it down at the end you of the are... month. You are going to you are going to take the hit on that one, but regardless of whether you take it down, you've still got it, haven't you? So uh, that's you true. Know, and still... I, I will be wearing it once I get the medal. Yeah, but interestingly, that that cat is now on um, Twitter as herself. I, I assume you had some influence over that. Um, me? Oh, are you not because the cat? You've we've. I'm, no, we're, not I'm, my I'm, cat. I was thinking, cat. why has his cat got a Twitter account? Does Scott not have enough to do? <laughs> Because she's got one eye. <laughs> she's Scott's <laughs> one-eyed cat. Little she miss. tweets about having lost her eye. Yeah, and anyway, being, no, struggling to find peace. biscuits. Yeah, cat peace. She's got I, the dice now. I, I, was she's say, coming. I don't think cat peace struggles to find biscuits. What What are you no. saying? 
Bosch, no, um, no, I just said to her, um, and she was she was very upfront, and it was it was. I, I'm not sure what the rationale behind it all was, but you know, I just said, well, just go for it if you want. You know, you know yeah. people are nice. And I, think... no, I, love I love that because I think that that you know, there's she's obviously doing a lot of work or trying to do a lot of work with the patches, um, and in actual fact, I I I love to hear from the personal side. So you know, she's tweeted me lots and lots as patches, and I think now I can see the person, and it's it's I'm more inclined to engage with the person than than the massive organisation yes. that I I thought she was a part of, which obviously she, it's not massive, but I think it still needs the support at the same time. Um, and I think that having the confidence to do that, actually, that's what, you know, that's what we need. We need her, we need people like Kat to be public. Yeah. Um, so that actually people will engage and then we can hear that voice properly. Yeah. When it's behind a... When it's behind an organisation, or you know, um, what, however you want to put it, I don't know how you put it. Less it's really difficult. It? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that you know the fact that she's gone and you know she spoke with uh, for the open net or at the open Nest conference yeah. and what have you. And that's really important. That's you know, it doesn't matter what organisation you go and speak to. You're sh- sharing that story, and you're giving you know you give yourself and your you know the people that are standing behind you who can't give that voice. You're giving them that voice. Um, and that's really quite important. Yeah, I mean, I've, I was looking across. I know we've got a really mad, busy schedule of a, of podcasts over the next few months, and we could probably do weekly, but we haven't got the time. Um, I've got we've got guests right up till almost May now, which is yeah. And they're all really interesting people, um, and increasingly we're trying to include adoptees in that because I think that they are the hidden voice. I mean, I'd I'd love to think that in the future we could maybe get you know, voices of birth families, but they're, I understand that that's a much, well, complicated, isn't it? It's, it's much more I don't sensitive. Think it's I think it'd be, yeah, it'd be more, it would, would be more difficult and it'd be more, we'd have to be a lot more sensitive in our, yeah, in our, yeah, yeah, just our approach to that. But I don't think it's impossible. And I know that, you know, we've got a lot of, um, we've got a lot of um, kind of listeners who can support that as well. So I don't think it's impossible, but, I think we need to be a little less. What's yeah. the word? A little less like idiots. There you go. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah. No, I know what you're saying. Idiot. I think, yeah, you've got to create a, a safe environment for people, haven't you? Yeah. Exactly. There I am being a snowflake again. Mm. Yeah. But, but in, in all fairness, I think that, you know, this is the adoption and fostering podcast. And, you know, we're both. Uh, um, I think we both take for granted that, you know, everybody remembers that we were foster carers. Mm-hmm. Um, we obviously have suddenly, suddenly Mummy, who we have on now and again. Um, you had to mention a friend of the show. I always have to mention a friend of the show, um, who's been, you know, uh, quite influential in terms of the fostering side of the podcast. Um, and But at the same time, you know, we're the adoptive parents in this, but we do need to the adoptee voice. Um, foster carers, foster child, you know, it'd be really nice to get a foster child on actually, or someone who, you know, only experienced foster. Yes, foster yes. like a younger than. Um, yeah. I think it's um, a difficult sum getting yeah, you under yeah. 18s. Under 18, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, and, and yeah, I, th- I think we need to bear that mind. And I think uh, at the same time, you know, it needs to cover all options. Um, and I know that there's, you know, there's probably some fabulous birth parents who've turned their life around and you know mm-hmm. well I know there is because we know that you know a lot of these birth parents actually you know eventually you know life do what on. they need to do to be able to yeah exactly and some of them go on to have more more family etc so you know I don't think it's impossible and I think that you know we need to we need to be all round on this if if we're serious which I think we both are serious about this yeah I'm um, carrying which um you know the first year was a bit of a trial to see how it went and see if we could, you know. But the fact that I've spent all that money on a microphone pack that doesn't work. Yeah, if only you'd bought the one I told you. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you know, I I think that the people in Madagascar are, are you know, they're on tenterhooks waiting for them to be um, released every fortnight. The podcast always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Always. Actually, I was looking at the list of um, podcast download geography and I, it does actually look like your holiday itinerary from last summer um i don't know what that <laughs> i was going around all the resorts saying can you just download yeah can you just download? yeah stealing um, people's phones yeah. and then like oh, subscribing them to the podcast 
Definitely. Oh, we should do yeah. that, shouldn't we? I'm going to start doing that. Anyway, we're, we're, we've moved from serious to prattle, waffling now. Anyway, right, it's been great to chat to you. I hope you have a fantastic week, and um, I no doubt you'll be busy. I'm always busy, yeah. Yes, I've, right. got, I've got yeah. all the lovelies of Educationville meeting with them on Tuesday. Oh, excellent. I'm yeah, visiting so. the school tomorrow to speak to my daughter's children, my daughter's teacher. Oh, are you indeed? Yes. I'm, is that going to be... A positive experience, or uh, I'm hoping <laughs> he said, okay. not wanting to breach any confidentiality. Uh, no. Anywho, okay. anywho, <laughs> awkward pause. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, okay, you look after yourself and um, have a great week. I do. Cheers, then. Bye-bye. bye bye. Bye bye.